Chronicle of the Times Robert Hitchens, The Man Who Sank the Titanic In today's episode, we take a look at the convoluted story of Robert Hitchens, the man steering the Titanic when it hit an iceberg. Hitchens' story does not end there, with many job changes, family entanglements, alcoholism, suicide attempts, and attempted murder some 25 years after the sinking of the Titanic. His story is one of dramatic events. We investigate the man who is recorded as being the man who sunk the Titanic. We really hope you enjoy the show. About Robert Hitchens. Hitchens was born in 1882, a soul destined to navigate life's tempestuous waters with a courage matched only by the trials that fate had in store. Born into a family of ten siblings, Robert emerged as the second son of Philip Hitchens and Rebecca Wood. His early years imbued with the stark realities of existence in St. Peter's Square in Wellington. His life was tinged with hardship, a life of scarcity where sustenance and wealth were elusive. At the tender age of 19, Robert yielded to paternal wisdom and embraced the call of the Royal Naval Reserve, a bastion of government training. A new path beckoned, one that led him towards a horizon untold. The embrace of the Naval Reserve proved fortuitous. Robert, resolute in spirit, emerged from his training an adept sailor, soon taking his place in the merchant services ranks. In 1906, destiny intertwined with affection as he united his fate with Florence Mortimer, whom he had encountered amidst the shores of Torquay during his service aboard the yacht Ariano. Their union brought forth the blessings of two daughters, forging a family amidst the backdrop of burgeoning Southampton. Hitchens' unblemished naval record and experience allowed him a position on the celebrated Titanics, and Hitchens secured a berth aboard her, becoming the second member of the crew listed in the ship's roster. Hitchens spent four days aboard the Titanic before the fateful voyage began. As the vessel's monumental form sliced through the waves, no one could guess that Robert's connection with her would become etched in the chronicles of history. The Titanic Before we continue with Hitchens' story, a reminder of why the Titanic was so monumental in its time. From the Aberdeen Press and Journal, June 1911, A Triumph of Marine Architecture The White Star Company are making history in the construction of Leviathans of the Atlantic, and with the launch today of the Titanic from the yard of Harland and Wolf, the company have now at the head of their huge fleet two vessels which are by far the largest in the world. All the best and the latest that up-to-date marine architecture and engineering could combine to produce is exemplified in these colossal crafts, which are practically unsinkable and unburnable, and this afford, as near as can be, absolute safety and security in ocean travelling. As is the case of the Olympic, however, the Titanic is so beautifully modelled that one fails on seeing the vessel to realise her gigantic proportions, for she sits in the water with all the grace of a modern steam yacht. Particulars are not yet available as to her equipment, as far as passenger accommodation is concerned, but this much 
is known, that, as on the Olympic, the fittings in respect of securing the comfort of passengers will embrace all that human skill and ingenuity can devise. There will be accommodation for upwards of 750 first-class passengers, 500 second-class and over 1,100 third-class, giving a total of about 2,500. The crew, all told, will number fully 800, and this, with a full complement of passengers, the vessel would have some 3,300 souls on board. For the safety of such a precious freight, it is obvious that the utmost precautions must be taken, and as previously indicated, the vessel is thoroughly fireproof and is constructed that if any commodity on board were to become ignited, it would be impossible for the fire to spread to any extent. Then the watertight compartments in number, size and arrangement are such that it is believed the ship could not in any circumstances sustain sufficient damage to prevent her still keeping afloat. Like all modern ocean-going vessels, the Titanic will have a powerful Marconi installation and Altogether, it seems as if those on board will be warranted in considering themselves at all times as safe as the most confirmed landlubber can ever be on shore. The Tragic Fate of the Titanic On April 15th, 1912, Hitchens was at the wheel when the Titanic struck the iceberg that would doom the vessel. The sinking of the Titanic claimed more than 1,500 lives. From the Belfast Telegraph, April 1912. Widespread mourning. It is not too much to say that two continents are plunged into mourning today over the loss of a gallant ship and many hundreds of valuable lives. Yesterday it was hoped that the Titanic, notwithstanding her terrible encounter with the iceberg off the Newfoundland coast, had safely escaped. Her passengers had been transferred to other vessels, which promptly came to the scene on the call of the wireless, and the good vessel herself under tow to a convenient harbour in which she might have carried out the necessary repairs to the damage she had sustained. In the early hours of this morning came the melancholy intelligence that the world's greatest ship was no more, and that of her complement of 2,358 souls, passengers and crew, only the comparatively small number of 675 had been accounted for. The balance of 1,000 Six hundred and ninety three, it was feared, having found a watery grave. The public could ill realize the news. It was too stupendously awful, too dramatically sudden for the mind to grasp it. It was one of those occurrences from the magnitude of which the mind recoils, is stunned and slowly recovers as from the stupefying effects of an anaesthetic. But message after message only confirmed the awful tidings, and the community spoke of the tragedy of the Titanic with bated breath, and thought sorrowfully of the dead and those who mourned them. Hitchens' actions were questioned. Accusations arose that he, after assuming control of a lifeboat, cruelly declined to return to the perilous scene to rescue fellow passengers. Such damning allegations have forever marked him as a figure mired in scorn, labelled both a bully and a coward. From the Berkshire Chronicle, 25th of April 1912. 
Titanic drama, strange scenes at the inquiry, allegations and denials. Scenes both strange and dramatic were witnessed at yesterday's inquiry at Washington into the sinking of the Titanic. In the inquiry, the appearance in custody of quartermaster Robert Hitchens, who was intended to leave for London. The Hour of Disaster Describing the actual sinking of the Titanic, the witness said, All lights disappeared. For an interminable hour, the night air was rent with wailing shrieks and cries. There was literally one great chorus of moans gradually diminishing, until even the strongest struggler in the water had gone down to his grave two miles in the deep. Rescue Impossible Quartermaster Hitchens, the witness, who was brought up in custody, told of his experiences in boat number six, of which he was in charge. He said that everybody had to row. He even asked the ladies. Mrs. Mayer accused him of using bad language and of wrapping himself in all the wraps and drinking all the whiskey. This he denied. Hitchens asked if he had any trouble with Major Pushan. Hitchens responded he did as when Major Pushan came aboard he tried to take command. Did the women urge you to go toward the Titanic? No, sir. Not that I remember, states Mr. Hitchens. Major Pushan said that when you were asked to go back to the rescue, the drowning, you said that you weren't going back after those stiffs. It is a lie, responds Hitchens. Do you wish the committee to understand that you did not refuse to go to the rescue of the people in the water? Hitchens responds, I could not go under the conditions. I was a mile away from the cries, and we had no compass. As investigations were pursued by both the British and American naval intelligence investigating the Titanic sinking, Hitchens was kept under virtual house arrest. Accusations flew from Major Pouchon and Margaret Molly Brown regarding his lack of compassion and his refusal to attempt to save any additional passengers in the sea. From the Daily Chronicle and Gazette, the 3rd of May, 1912. Hitchens testifies. I was in charge of number six and was ordered to pull away towards a distant light. We had on board 38 women, a seaman, myself and an Italian lad and the Canadian major. I told then that we would have to pull away from the ship as she was going down by the head. Everybody had to row. I even asked the ladies. We started for the light which we thought to be that of a fishing schooner. We borrowed a fireman from one of the other boats to help us to row, but we got no nearer to the light. The ladies were getting nervous. One of them, Mrs. Mayer, accused me of using bad language, of wrapping myself in all the wraps and drinking all the whiskey. This I deny. I stand all night at the tiller through the cold. When asked if Hitchens had indeed instructed that everyone to row away from the Titanic, Hitchens replies, Yes, sir. I was afraid of the suction. The lifeboats were all together shortly before the Titanic sank. We were all pulling for that light. The Titanic was still afloat when we stopped. The lights disappeared about 15 minutes later. Hitchens is asked if he heard cries of distress. Yes, he replies, for several minutes. Some men in the boat said that they were the cries of people in the other boats signalling. Before leaving the witness stand, Hitchens asked permission to make a personal statement relating to the charges made by Mrs. Mayer in the newspapers that morning. This woman states, he said, that I drank all the whiskey I could. I had been up all night, and a woman who had a flask 
gave me a spoonful. Another woman gave me half a wet blanket to wrap round myself. That was all, sir. I think the lady's remarks unkind, sir. Hitchens was released officially, although unofficially questions remained regarding his ethos and actions. Hitchens was cautious to ensure that none of his statements placed the White Star Company in a bad light. The White Star Company, aware of Hitchens' attempts to limit damage aspersions of the company, promised Hitchens lifelong employment and good wages for his silence during the investigations. Hitchens complied. Hitchens was sent to South Africa, one of the furthest posts the company had, and far away from his wife and children. The taint of cowards seemed to follow him, at least in his own mind. In 1914, Hitchens returned to England as World War I began. Hitchens served on the HMS Victory, but suffered with a condition now known to be similar to post-traumatic stress syndrome. The condition left him prone to headaches, nightmares, anxiety attacks and fatigue. It followed him for the next 20 years. However, Hitchens still needed to support his family. He continued to work as a quartermaster. Looking to change his luck, Hitchens and his family moved to Torquay in the 1920s. Here he bought a small motorboat which he named the Queen Mary. It would end up spinning his life out of control. The murder attempt. The purpose of the boat purchase was to take customers out on pleasure cruises to support his family. In order to buy the boat, Hitchens took out two loans. The loans were supplied by a man named Frederick Henley, who Hitchens felt seemed to delight in constantly pressing Hitchens for payments and demanding payment unceasingly. With the aftermath of the war and the following depression, customers were scarce. Hitchens took to drinking, which had a devastating effect on his family. Between the lack of customers being hounded for payment and his drinking, the family were evicted from their accommodation for rent arrears. Florence had had enough. In 1931, she took herself and their now six children and left Hitchens, returning to stay with family in Southampton. With his family gone, homeless, without employment and still suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome, Hitchens' drinking continued as he travelled the country as a tramp looking for work. In 1933, blaming the whole of the evils that had fallen him on Henley, the lender he had borrowed money from, Hitchens purchased a small revolver and returned to Torquay with the aim of killing the man who he felt had been the source of all his troubles. Hitchens found Henley and shot him in the head. Miraculously, the bullet did not hit any bone and only superficially wounded him. Henley escaped the attack and managed to alert police who collected Hitchens, and newspaper reports reported Hitchens' attempt to shoot himself in the head, but resulting only in an injury to his nose. From the Coventry Evening Telegraph, the 29th of November, 1933. Navigating officer charged. The man who steered the Titanic, allegation of attempted murder. A man who was actually at the wheel of the Titanic when she struck an iceberg in 1912 appeared in the dock at Winchester Assizes today, charged with attempted murder. Robert Hitchens, 51, described as a navigating officer, was charged before Mr Justice Dupark with the attempted murder of Frederick George Henry Henley at Torquay on November the 12th by shooting him. Mr. F. S. Leesky, 
for the prosecution said that the men had known each other for four years, both getting their living by the sea. Trouble arose over the sale of a motorboat, and a year later Hitchens returned to Torquay armed with a revolver and with the alleged intention of killing Henley. He called on Henley, who told him, I won't lend you a penny because you have been a rogue and a scamp to me. Hitchens fired at Henley's head, wounding him over the ear. Henley struck him on the jaw and knocked him down. Two more shots were fired but missed, and then, as Hitchens lay on the ground, he fired another two shots at himself. When arrested, Hitchens said, Is he dead? I hope he is. He is a dirty rat. Evidence was then called. A taxi driver said that Hitchens was drunk when he went to Henley's house. Prisoner's Letters P.C. Southcott said in one letter Hitchens had written, No home, no pension, no dole, I can't get an officer's berth, result, dead by my own hand. I am no coward, but this rotter has to go out as well. To the editor of the Sunday newspaper he had written, there will be something more to add to my book, the last man at the wheel of the ill-fated liner Titanic, the world's greatest sea disaster. I'm going to shoot myself. I have a wife and children at Southampton somewhere, the best wife in the world. Police Sergeant Hutchins said that Hitchens was at the wheel of the Titanic when she went down. In custody, Hitchens once again attempted to kill himself by slitting his wrists. This attempt was also caught in time, and Hitchens escaped with minor injuries. Hitchens was found guilty of attempted murder and given a five-year jail sentence in Pankhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight. From the Illustrated Police News, the 7th of December 1933, man who steered the Titanic five years for attempted murder. A man who was at the wheel of the Titanic when she struck an iceberg in 1912 and sank with a loss of 1,513 lives was sentenced to five years penal servitude at Winchester Assizes. He was Robert Hitchens, 51, a navigating officer, and he was charged with the attempted murder of Frederick Henley at Torquay on November the 12th by shooting him. Mr. F. S. Lasky for the prosecution said trouble arose over the sale of a motorboat by Henley to Hitchens, who paid down £100, which he borrowed. As he, Hitchens, did not repay the loan, the boat was taken from him, but not by Henley. Your last word. Twelve months afterwards, Hitchens returned to Torquay armed with a revolver and told a fisherman, I have come down to kill Henley and myself. I have got a packet in my pocket for him and myself. After visiting two or three taverns, Hitchens took a taxicab to Henley's address. He asked Henley to help him, and Henley said, you owe me sixty pounds. I won't lend you a penny because you have been a rogue and a scamp to me. Hitchens, continued counsel, said that in your last word and pulling a revolver from his pocket, he fired at Henley's head, wounding him over the ear. Henley knocked him down. Two more shots rang out but missed. As Hitchens lay on the ground, he fired two more shots at himself. The defence called no evidence, but submitted that Hitchens' reason was dethroned as the result of his ordeal in the Titanic and of drink. Whilst in prison, Hitchens managed to renew his relationship with Florence and was allowed to move back into the family home upon the prison release in 1937. However, tragedy continued to plague the footsteps of Hitchens. 
Florence was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumour. Hitchens stuck by her as the main carer until the tumour and illness overwhelmed Florence. Florence died. Hitchens was heartbroken. With no wish to stay in Southampton, the place of his wife's tragic death, Hitchens took a position on a cargo ship named the English Trader. It was now the Second World War. Hitchens' ship travelled between Africa and Britain, often under heavy attack from enemy aircraft. Hitchens' dramatic and hard life came to an end on December the 23rd, 1940, as he died in his cabin from heart failure. Hitchens was 58. That concludes this episode of Eccentric Sundays. Robert Hitchens, the man who sank the Titanic. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we would be so grateful if you could like and subscribe to our channel. We upload three days a week. Tuesdays is our Vintage Voices series, including an Agony Aunt section, a recipe section, and the gossip of the day. Thursdays is an episode looking at the lighter sides of Georgian, Victorian, and Edwardian times. And Sundays, with a recounting of stories by authors such as Dickens, Munro, Conan Doyle, M. R. James, and Wilkie Collins. If you like this channel, you may like our sister channel, News of the Times, which looks at crime stories from the past. From all of us here at Chronicle of the Times, thank you for watching, liking and subscribing. This has been Chronicle of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>